talk uh, is about really uh, Internet of Things, the ecosystem of Internet of Things. And I will uh, speak a little bit about how we can use uh, Kotlin for develop IoT uh, solutions. And we will uh, start defining where is IoT if you are uh, never listening about IoT or don't know uh, nothing. So in a real uh, uh, definition uh, of EOT, like a, a pragmatic definition, says that the Internet of Things, or IoT, is a system of interrelated computing devices, mechanical and digital machines, objects, animals, or people that are provided with unique identifiers, and the ability to transfer data over a network with a, without requiring human-to-human -human or human-to-computer interactions. But if we can define this in more simple terms, we can say that IoT solutions are put to things that are not commonly have internet, internet for make something. So for example, if I want to say that some solution that I have in my smartphone is an IoT solution, is not. Why? Because in smartphones, or now it's really commonly have internet, not like 30 years ago, right? So we are connecting things that are not commonly. A little bit of history about the Internet of Things. We have this uh, Coke machine that was in the Carnegie Mellon University in the United States. And what's happening with this uh, Coke machine is that the people cross all the university for go to the machine. And when they arrive to the machine, the machine don't have Cokes. Or the coast was not cold. So that people say, this is a waste of time, you know? It's a crab game for a coat, and we don't have coats here. So they put some sensors first for see if the machine has coats or not. The next thing that they may put for a, for a chronometer that established how long ago the vendor of the coats arrived to the university for put uh, coats in the machine, so they can know if the, the coats will be cold or not. A other example that we have is the, the coffee the coffee maker in a, a developer's company. So developers don't want to go make the journey to the kitchen for found a coffee machine without coffee, right? So they put a camera for see the, the level of coffee, of coffee that has in the machine. So that was the beginning of the IoT uh, solutions. Now we have really, really a biggest uh, industry around IoT solutions. And all this start, for example, uh, with small appliances or small homes, right? So for example, last year, uh, in this last year was uh, an example of the light bulbs that were hacked, right? But this is, a, for example, an example of a smart homes solutions. Um, in a smart appliances, the first things that we saw were a smart refrigerators. The, they say to you, we, I will tell you when you need more milk, or when you need to brown eggs, or when you need to brown meat, uh, based on what we are monitoring in your refrigerator. And uh, now we have uh, smart buildings too. For example, hotels are one of these uh, solutions. Right now, we are not using any more these cards in hotels, not in all of them, but sometimes we install an application that works with the things in the, in the hotel rooms. So I can open the door there, I can uh, manage the lights inside the room, the air conditioner, the windows, everything uh, about an applications. Now we have more, uh, for example, smart TVs was something too, and uh, now we have the part of smart health, or for example, athletes use a lot of we wearables in their clothes or for kind of have metrics about their uh, body condition when they are making uh, sports. And then they can see graphics about uh, their behaviors doing all these things. Uh, in a smart health, we can have two these things about, uh, for example, detect easily when we will have a heart attack or how it is the condition in the blood of the people for no uh, predictions about if they will have diabetes or things like that. And we have smart cities too and smart cards. This is our part of the, all the IoT ecosystems. And what how, well, I didn't mention too that smart farming. This is a really big industry that we are an improvement how we all, uh, the crops that we have in farming. Uh, this is for reduce the resource, so we make a better handle of the resource that we have. For example, we have limited resource like water, right? Uh, one example here is, for example, in Netherlands, uh, they are reducing the amount of liters of water from 24 liters of water for one crop to one liter of, of water for these crops. So it's a really huge reduction using these kind of technologies. And what happened with IoT is that they are really helping us uh, 
to create a variety of ideas that we can improve oh, all our industries, right? So we can in there create solutions for operate more efficiently or for can make analysis of behaviors that we have in our industry and can make better those things. So for example, in Guatemala, we have uh, solutions that they uh, are offering uh, for companies in uh, food courts. So they want to uh, try to analyze how the customers of all these restaurants in a food court uh, is the behavior. And they are suggesting them that what things they can do for improve uh, all these customer services. So it's an analyze of which days they are having more uh, people attending the, for buy food in this food or for example, when days they need more people than other days. And we have three kinds of IoT projects. And the first one is uh, just IoT projects that only collect information and send them information that uh, then we will analyze with big data or artificial intelligence. The next thing that we have is uh, IoT solutions that receive instructions. So this is like the smart bulls. We only say that do that and they just do that. And finally, we have a project where we make both things, right? Collect information and receive instructions. And I have here these pictures about the crops. Uh, one of the things that we are doing for example, in small uh, farming, is analyze the moisture soil in the, in the crops. So we are defining the level of humidity. And I know based on which crop is how many water or humidity we need in the soil. So I know when Kai uh, will turn off the irrigation system. Instead of always have this uh, turn on or give them more water than what they need. So, but all the IoT is a really a big ecosystem, right? And um, what happened in this ecosystem or in actuality is that sometimes people just focus in the part when we collect the information. So this hardware project. But they forgot that we have other uh, sections in this ecosystem. So how I will send the information for my IoT devices, the hardware, uh, to the cloud. Or oh, this uh, need to have a, a proposal. So I am collecting information. And what we will do with this information? And the other thing is uh, in this part of when all this is focusing the collection data, is that becoming a fight between Arduino and Raspberry Pi, and the, are people fighting about uh, one is better than other. And the uh, first thing is that these are not interchangeable uh, technologies, right? An Arduino is a microcontroller, and a Raspberry Pi is a microprocessor. So we cannot really, really establish it which one is better than the other one. And the second thing is that these two are really uh, student tools. What uh, is technology created for can teach people? Uh, and the other thing that I say is that we are watching uh, solutions in production using these two cards that we are watching here. And this is just prototyping cards, really are not for launch to production. So for establishing a difference, uh, a microcontroller really is a really a small computer in a single integrated circuit. So that means that in this same circuit, I will have a CPU, and establish the amount of RAM, a small memory, my GPUs. And in a microprocessor, it's just the CPU inside the integrator circuit. I need to put all the kind of uh, the amount of RAM that I need. I need to add the amount of memory that I want. So uh, something that happened with microcontrollers is that sometimes we have a really, really, really limited amount of memory. Sometimes we can have just four kilobytes of memory for run as. Uh, my project, right? So it's, it's really a small, but it's more efficient sometimes processing things uh, related with read our sensors. But in a microprocessor, when I need more memory or uh, processing capacity, is better. But I need to spend a little more of money for can add the rest of the things that I need in my project. And then, well, in this ecosystem, then we will have the other section. Uh, how I will uh, communicate my devices with the final destination of the information. And we can use here an IoT hub or and an IoT gateway. And then finally, we need to establish it, how I will analyze my information, uh, which kind of algorithms I will run. I will make uh, artificial intelligence or only big data. Or how I will show these results to the people. Or how I will help others to improve their business. And finally, something that uh, usually developers forgot is security. Right? It's like security doesn't exist until everything goes wrong. 
right? But we need to take uh, about a security since the beginning. So this is why this talk is uh, implication in an IoT project. It's something that I call beyond the things, right? Because when we are making IoT, it's not only make our hardware project. Uh, and other thing that happened is that we are seeing a lot of uh, young people or makers making these uh, beautiful projects with Arduino and Raspberry Pi that are seeking lines and those things. But this is ours only, uh, this is not real IoT projects. So are just uh, exercises for learn to use the, the hardware. So my name is Mercedes Biz. I am from Guatemala. I am a community leader for uh, J. Duchess chapter there. I was two member of Guatemala Java Users Group. And actually I am a, in nowadays a CTO in a startup called Productivity based in Guatemala. So I will show you here uh, in a small picture that have a, like a example that how works uh, all the ecosystem in an IoT project. So this is a project that is uh, monitoring things uh, like the weather, for example. And we can see that they have a, here a, I will see this word, okay, there. We have here a broker that is uh, collecting all the information for these sensors and send it to an IoT gateway agent. And this agent is the one that is saving this information in a, in a database. And then they have a few APIs. And here we have other ones for the weather or for incorporate our information in Twitter or in other places. So everything start collecting information and then we need to process this information for show that to the people in some way. And we can have other kind of more complicated uh, solutions. So I can have APIs, uh, apps that we will use this information. So I will have my devices with sensors. I will have here a make QTT uh, device that will collect all this information. And for example, here they process all this information for big data using Hadoop. And then they send that to uh, some cloud uh, customer for have enterprise applications and finally provide this information here. So what about Kotlin, right? Because maybe you came here for Kotlin. So first, uh, well, I was speaking with a lot of people that make IoT solutions and many of them, or basically the 99% of them don't like use Java, for example. And yeah, and first uh, I say that maybe it's something about ignorance because people don't know, for example, that exists a uh, many Java virtual machines. So how many Java virtual machines do you know? Yeah, exactly two. This guy say two, you know, yes, like, thanks God, because usually in that, the Java developers don't know that. So which one do you know? Open GPM. Which one is the normal? Oh, okay, no. So, so he don't know. So he was speaking, talking about the uh, Oracle JDK and the Open JDK one, right? No, um, the virtual machine is something different. For example, if I download the JDK from Oracle and I watch in the console, I exist. I don't know if you read uh, when you check the version that appears something that is called hotspot. Yeah, someone read that in the console. Yeah, you know what the fuck is hotspot? is the virtual machine that is with this one. So in that, when we download the open JDK, they say you want to download the version with hotspot or with J9. And someone asked, where is the difference between hotspot and J9? Is the J9 is other virtual machine. So how many of you attend a talk about GraalVM? Yes. And where is GraalVM? It's a virtual machine, right? It's like <laughs> she's laughing, right? It's other virtual machine for run Java application. And it's not the only ones that exist. It exists many ones. So the people that make IoT solutions don't know that too. And then came and say Java is something really heavy for run in an IoT project. So the footprint of Java is really biggest. But they don't know that exists. So if the Java developers don't know that exist several Java virtual machines, what we can explain of them that they are not uh, Java developers and exist uh, virtual machines that are defined for run uh, in uh, microprocessors for make IoT. So how many of you me know Azul system technologies? You? You, yes. Si Simon Rittler is, is the name of the guy. How many of you attend a talk of Simon Ritter or Oh, watch one in YouTube. Oh my God. 
Well, a SUL system has something called SULU. How many of you listening about SULU before? Yeah, we, okay. SULU is a virtual machine that we can use for run uh, job applications in uh, embedded devices like a Raspberry Pi. So it's a small one. So people don't like use Java for that. And this is something that extends to Kotlin. Why? Because in the beginning, Kotlin is a programming language that run over the Java virtual machine. So we need to use a virtual machine, and then the programming language will run that. And what is other problem is that we really, in Java, don't have access to the uh, hardware level of things. We need to use, for example, the Java native interface for have communication with uh, low level uh, things. So we use uh, C libraries in native language for make the communication for the GPUs, that is for read the sensors. And the same thing happened in Kotlin, but hope Kotlin is not only a programming language that run over a Java virtual machine. They have also a native Kotlin. So when we use native Kotlin, we avoid the part to use a virtual machine for run it. But equals, Kotlin don't have the power to run things in low level. So we equals need a native interface for have the communication with the C libraries. So developers don't like it. I make a a huge investigations about things uh, related with Kotlin and IoT, and the only articles that I found was about Hadi, uh, Hadi Partobi is the guy from JetBrains. Yeah, my friend, Hadi Partobi is the name, or Hadi something, Hadi Hairi. Hariri, okay, Hadi Hariri. He wrote some articles about how to use Kotlin in IoT, but they need to a native interface. Uh, so we have all the things in C, uh, programming language, for can establish communication with HPEOs or other kind of inputs and outputs that we have, writing memory, and then up to that we use Kotlin. So in the beginning, Kotlin cannot be used in any microcontroller because the footprint of Kotlin is really biggest for running devices down have 4K, uh, 16 KB of memory. So uh, IoT developers uh, mostly use C when they are developing uh, IoT solutions for microcontrollers. And sometimes they use Python when we are using uh, microprocessors. But we have other solution that is uh, like the most used in the world of Kotlin. And it's because Google tried to use all this infrastructure that they have about development Android solutions. And the, all the people that now make uh, native Android applications can use their knowledge for create IoT without have a huge uh, learning uh, curve, right? So they was exploring that. So what they do was, reduce the operating system of Android for microprocessors. And well, they have some a few benefits, and one of the benefits first is that we can use the same infrastructure of Android Studio for develop these applications. The next thing is that they created a lot of libraries for we can have a more easy access to hardware like displays or cameras. Um, the other things that they have is that obviously create two uh, libraries for main communication with cloud solutions, like obviously the Google Cloud and Firebase. Uh, for example, I have a friend that is trying to use the Firebase database uh, in real time because they need to create uh, like uh, messages in two ways. So. The IoT device send information, but also receive information. And one thing that happens there is that it's not like the push notifications. If not, they need to have a callback that always is listening and something is coming to their way. So for them, it's trying to use this power that have the real-time uh, database for sending information in two ways. So this is something that is more easy to integrate if we are using the uh, Android things. The next thing is that we have two uh, integrated additional peripherals. So we have the HPEOs and other kind of standards. We, I have here this ones. So we have the HPEOs, that is the general purpose inputs and outputs, right? That we use for it can detect uh, motion sensors or proximity or anything. And then we have the pulse width modulations that we use, for example, for motors. Uh, what happens when I have a motor is that it depends on the velocity that I want to the motor, I need to send uh, the level of the frequency of the power. So I need to uh, 
uh, try to, I need to handle this power. So this is something that we can do more easy with this one. And we have some uh, serialization communications too for establishing this one. Other thing that happened a lot if uh, IoT projects is that uh, my IoT projects not always have access to internet. So in that, uh, it's like really weird cases, they have access to the internet, except if I have that in a small building or in a small home, ha uh, home that have always access to internet. But what happens if I have in that small farming? So it's in the middle to some farming when it's no signal of cell phones, right? So one problem is make actualizations over the projects that we have in the IoT devices. Uh, usually we need to go in presence for make these actualizations to the IoT uh, devices. So they launch a kind of something like the Google Play, for example, for I can handle all these projects. Uh, and if my devices have access to internet, they will uh, handle the actualization of my software. And an extra benefit, but in IoT devices, it's really hard to know the date and the time when I am making this, because don't have access to anything. Uh, the people of Google, we don't know what they do. I, I really believe that they make many dark magic for all of us for, for make things, yes. Uh, so they create a way, an uh, easy way that only say, you know, I want the date, I want the time, and they provide to us that one. So we don't need to handle with that. So something, uh, a few negative, but not much, is like we only have two uh, microprocessors when we can run a, IoT solutions with uh, the Android things. That is the NX Pico and Raspberry Pi T3 Model B. Uh, this is a, an image of the SDK that we have in Android. So in Android things, so we know that Android is based on a Linux, right? And they have a hardware abstraction layer for uh, have all this communication. Here we also have here the native uh, C and C++ libraries that we will use. And then we have all these, the Java P framework, the Google services, and all the things support library for can you use the GPE or the PWD. And then we have our apps uh, uh, inside there. Okay, ready, okay. Then uh, we can introduce in, uh, in Android things, use native code. So if I want to use all the libraries that we have uh, made in C or C++, I can establish it if I want to use that or not. Uh, what we need to define that is that if I will don't use them, the best thing that I can do is establish that. So what we'll do the Android thing is remove all these uh, native libraries that I will not use for reduce the size of my application. So here is a, a, a fast example that how we will create a IoT application. So I am the choosing Android things. I will create a here. Well, I don't know if you know about Android for our main uh, component in Android is called an activity. So I choose that I will create an activity and I am choosing there that it will be for a Kotlin programming language. And the next thing is uh, establish it. Uh, well, there will be an empty one. We will generate, well, I will live in that when I don't need that one. And I can choose in that the launch, in that is better, launch activity automatically on both. Something that happened in IoT devices is that will not anyone that will be, say, start the application. So we need to this start alone always that we turn on the device. For example, if in one moment they uh, stop to having a uh, Battery, and when they have a gain battery, uh, this start again. Uh, well, we have some dependencies. Uh, Android things use uh, Gradle for that, so we are adding the dependencies for the Android things, and they have a manifest file for the find on the components that we have. Here, uh, this is the first definition of that component, but we need to add this other one uh, with a category launcher for uh, the find that we will uh, start automatically when we enter that. And here have a few diagrams of what we will use. So this is a really simple example. It's just for define how we will use the GPEOS in Android things. Uh, so we will have a LED and we will have a button. So always that I press the button, I will change the state of the LED. So here we are using some uh, the IO thing, Android Things uh, library. So we have here a peripheral manager. This is the one that I will use for, say, which uh, GPEOS I will use. It will be a GPE for read, for write, or for uh, obtain those, uh, both information. And the GPEO callback is when I am listening for a GPE. So I need to always have a callback listening that. And I am defining here a tag just if I want to put the logs. Uh, here I am not putting the button ping name. That 
depends of the uh, microprocessors that I'm using. So every GPU have a name. So we so wait for it. We can read that. And I am defining a button GPU that is a GPU for read everything. Uh, so then if we have a, in the activities a special method that is called the uh, on create one, here is when I will initialize all the things that I need to use. So I am using the peripheral manager here for open a connection to the GPUs. Then I am uh, establishing that I will read uh, the first GPU, uh, and I am putting there in the GPU direction in, that I means that I am reading information for that GPU, right? And I am establishing a net trigger tag with edge falling, and I am assigning a callback. So that means that I always will be reading there. And here is the callback. So right now, I am just uh, printing in console that I am reading something. And we don't need to forget that if, if this uh, and for something, we need to call uh, close everything, right? Now, uh, we will uh, delete. We will add this to. We need to. Uh, read which is the name of the GPU that I will use and put the name there. I will define a variable for a reading this GPU. So this is how I, I add this in the on create. So now I am putting this direction out initially low, right? Because I am sending energy to a LED. So I am saying that we will be just a little bit really low power for my LED don't make I don't know how to say that in English. Que se queme. Yes. Exactly, that one. OK, perfect. And now this is the callback. So always that we make a change. So the callback receive information, that means that we press the, the button. So I will put the opposite. So it was turned on, I will turn off. It was turned off, I will turn on. E, I need to close everything. So sometimes it's not so hard, right? The problem is the, the rest of the things that came after. So now I have here a few images about production versus prototyping. And maybe it's a little bit exaggerated, or maybe not, but exist people that make production solutions in that way. Yes, yeah, it's more close. <laughs> yes, so they have here uh, an Arduino, right? Uh, the lights for can turn on and turn off this since, uh, since an app, right? And this is what I say to you. This is just hard for prototyping solutions. And I am putting these images because in one talk, someone asked me if this is not the way to launch a IoT project to solution, which one is the, the solution? So we really need to print our integrated circuit. So these are some images that provided a friend of mine that have a hacker space in Guatemala that is called Shivalba. And he, well, he made the print of his images, his pro, uh, products, so we can have their, the battery, right? So you don't show the, the battery in really, really bad way. So we have the front and the back side. And I think that we can see here that this is uh, their Arduino, right? So we are not seeing this, uh, this integrator circuit that is prototyping. He has the basic uh, um, Arduino, and he is using all this for can connect with the specific GPUs that he need and all the sensors that he is using. And this is just a small video that this uh, working, right? So when we launch something to production, we need to create our integrator circuit. So now we will talk about the security and connection. So I have this, the cost of connectivity. So how can expensive can be uh, putting an IoT project internet to them? So I will return to the example to the smart farming. So what happens if I am in a farming with a lot of all of kilometers of crops? I don't have their internet all the time. Exist some solutions that I can incorporate, for example, a CCD, no, yes the chips with internet to my projects. But I need to uh, pay for that. So for example, I can pay 50 euros for every one of these de devices. And then I need to pay for a monthly plan for can integrate uh, internet for them. And this can be, for example, 2 euros. So how much will be have this solution for 50 IoT devices? So I will need to pay at least 25 euros for incorporate this uh, to my projects. But how many I will pay monthly for this internet? Maybe 100 euros. So for example, in Guatemala, I say our minimum salary is, for example, something in euros, maybe in the people that work in farming is 
200 euros. So the people win monthly 200 euros. And what happens if I, ha I have 500 devices for hand handling all the farming? And I will say, you will need to pay 1,000 euros of internet. He said, what? No, I will continue paying 200 euros to this guy in that when the process could be a small, a, a slowly, right? Or not more efficient. So we can know that all the time. And sometimes our IoT projects, depends on the hardware that we choose, don't have all the power to use that. So we have a few uh, standards that we use for transport the information to our IoT devices to the final destination. Of course, we can use always Wi-Fi, especially if our IoT projects will be in uh, environments that have access to this. For example, is small homes or small buildings or small cities. Then we have Bluetooth. So for example, all these solutions that we have for small health or athletes use, sometimes they uh, catch this information and then they connect with Bluetooth to their smartphones for it can transfer the information for the IoT device to the smartphone and the smartphone have an application that we show then uh, results about their uh, behavior making sports. Then we have these other ones. We have the six low pan that is an internet protocol basically uh, based on an IPv6, just that it's more light. I will be a little bit fast because I will not have much time. Uh, at the end, I have a link when this uh, presentation is so all you can go there and read perfectly this. Then we have six way that is a low power uh, frequency radio. Uh, that is used for home automation for products like lamps or sensors inside homes. And we have data raised to 100 kilobytes per second and operates in a sub 1 gigahertz band. Then we have the thread. Uh, this is for home automation, was uh, thinking in home automation, and is based on six low pan and was designed as a complement of Wi Fi. Then we have Zigbee. This is a really, really interesting one. They have a uh, really, really uh, huge amount of protocols that we can use depends uh, of the situation of our IoT projects. And it's based on the IEEE uh, 802.15.4. Uh, and it's related with free, uh, in frequent uh, data exchange of low rates. And we can use that with 100 uh, meters of range, uh, like homes or buildings. Then we have, when we need to transport a lot of information or a high guess, uh, data, we can use this cellular. This is one of the most expensive uh, protocols for uh, using IoT solutions, uh, but we can uh, send high qualities of data, especially we have a 4G uh, internet of band. Uh, it's expensive and have a lot of power consumption that is other than needed, we need to take in mind for IoT solutions. Then we can use to this uh, near file communication that is, for example, that one use right now, the, the credit cards. When I go to one place and I just put that uh, near, use the MVC, uh, also applications for, for make payments that I to put close to that. Uh, our smartphones right now have this protocol. Then we have six folks. Too, that is other alternative for wide range technologies and was designed for handle low data transference uh, e handle speeds of one, uh, 10 to 1,000 uh, bytes per second. And something interesting about that is that just consume 50 microwatts compared with the 5,000 microwatts that it consumes cellular technologies, for example. Uh, then we have Neultu, uh, that is uh, something similar to six volts and also works too in the sub one gigahertz uh, band. And is really, this just the uh, a piece of the TV white spectrum for make the transport of the information. And um, then we have finally LoRa, LoRa one. This is uh, one of the most uh, chooses protocol. It's like the favorite one. LoRa one is a few of uh, anthems that we put in uh, some places. Uh, this work for sending information that is really far away to uh, send a place that is the like the center of control to all the information. So the devices. Uh, put all the information in this uh, intermediate place, and then this intermediate place is the one that sends all the information to the final destination. So this is what we use for transfer information to our sensors to an IoT hub or an IoT gateway. Um, well, 
is uh, sometimes can be used to for send the information directly to the final destination. But this is if we are using really uh, protocols like Wi-Fi or Six Low Pound that have uh, direct access to the internet. So here we have two uh, definitions. If you see in the images, we have the IoT Hub. The IoT Hub basically is a is an interface that provides a cloud for we for the IoT projects can communicate directly to all the uh, cloud solutions for IoT. Uh, we will see in a few slides, but in IoT devices, we don't use HTTP protocol for transfer information. We use MQTT protocol. And the MQTT protocol have a, well, it's, it's small, small. We will talk about that one. So the IoT hub is designed for can have the communication with MQTT. And they transform all this MQTT to HTTP for handle the communication with the rest of the options that we have in the clouds. Sometimes we will not use this cloud solution, so we need to develop our own IoT hub. So something that transforms this MQTT to HTTP and send to my services. So for example, if I am making a serverless solution or a microservices solution for handle my IoT uh, information. The next thing that we have is the IoT Gateway. The IoT Gateway basically is an edge or an intermediate place when I, we, I am saving all the information. So what happened is that can be really expensive as the stay sending all this information in real time to the cloud. So sometimes I may, to my sensors, send the information to this IoT gateway. The IoT gateway will save all this information. And in certain time, on a, when I have a, some amount of information, the IoT gateway will be send that information to the cloud. So the IoT gateway is, uh, will receive two MQTT with the MQTT information, and then we'll communicate to the cloud like he wants with MQTT if I am using an IoT hub or directly with HTTP to other kind of uh, solution that I have, right? So this is basically a hardware device that is sa uh, saving all the information. Uh, this is so important too because, for example, in microcontrollers, I cannot stay saving a lot of information inside the microcontroller, so I can have a device that really have a lot of uh, memory capacity for save that information. So we have here the transfer information protocol that is I was telling to you that here they use MQTT. So they, this have uh, some principles and assumptions. And the principles of MQTT is that we need to think in simplicity. So next, things need to be more and smallest. The, things, the next thing that we have here is publish and subscribe messaging. Um, we need to think on how the sensors that we have in our devices works. Uh, the other thing is that server administration. Sometimes we need to create something that that receiver can handle information in that if this is not coming in the format that we want. So our MQTT receiver need to be a little bit smart for a, can handle the. Uh, I don't know, information that is not expecting, so some different behavior. And well, we need to minimize the footprint that our MQTT communication. And finally, this is uh, something that we need to, really important, is data agnostic. So this means that we need to depend that I will receive a JSON, or I will receive an XML, and I will make a magic library this that transform my JSON string to an object that I will handle. And that sometimes the people, uh, when we are taking information for sensors, sometimes, for example, if I have a sensor of temperature, I only will send temperature. So I can send just that temperature. Or if I will send a temperature and the date, I can separate that by commas. And I know to the first one is the temperature and the second one is the date. Or I can see, for example, OK, the date is something I am sending in milliseconds, right? So it will be something long and the temperature will not. So for read that. Uh, the next thing is that we need to prepare it for sometimes the network is uh, disruptive, right? So I need to see how handle I will in the side of the uh, microcontroller or the microprocessor and in the side of the person that will send that. And we have here a XML or JSON, so maybe we'll need to 
forgot that that exists and create a more line in a way to transfer the information. The next thing that have MQTT is that they are reducing a lot of headers in the communication. So maybe here I will not need all these things and I will send only the necessary headers. Uh, ways to, well, I make investigation and this is our one of the two most uh, popular libraries for implementing MQTT, that is Mosquito and Pajo, both of them or uh, Eclipse uh, uh, solutions. Then what about security, right? Because IoT solutions need security. One of the problems that we will have in an IoT solution is that don't exist a human that will send a credentials for me make an authorization process, for example. So we use uh, certifications. When I configure the first time my IoT software, I will download in the IoT uh, product a certification. And this certification will be now the credential of this device. So I will have to a kind of authorization server that will receive these certifications for return a token to my MQTT client. Something that happened here in IoT solutions is that sometimes we don't have amount of memory for make an actualization of the certification. And that depends uh, sometimes of the uh, strategy. So if I am say, saving information in my uh, IoT device, uh, sometimes this information is heavy. What, what happened here is if I will make an actualization of my certification, I cannot erase the uh, old certification before to have the first one. So I need to download the new one and have the both of them in one moment uh, saving in my IoT device and then erase that old one. And sometimes I cannot make that. You know, download the new one because I don't have enough space. So this is just the, the only problem that people is uh, facing when develop IoT solutions. But then it's, uh, it's really a good, good solution, make this uh, machine to machine uh, communications for the authentication. So the next thing is that, what about my backend, right? Maybe serverless will be a good solution for, for IoT. I don't need to create a microservice or a normal monolith solution. Why? Because sometimes I only need to send one kind of information. So I only need a web service that is receiving that information. So I like to put this that there is no cloud, it's just someone else's computer. Because people don't like in serverless because they say don't exist server. But this is because they don't configure this server, but the server exists just that we are delegating to someone else to handle this, uh, uh, this information. So if you don't know, where, someone of you know where is serverless? Yes, yes, no, 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 no. Yes, they say yes, okay, you? Okay, a few ones. Okay, don't worry. I am putting here this image. So in your right, we have a, a monolith architecture. That we have, well, microservices, you know where is microservices, right? Yeah, perfect. So I can skip this slide, right? But the main focus of microservices is that I am uh, like putting everything in whole, small modules, right? For handle information. So this is other monolith application when I have a host instance, my application, and all my operations. What happened in serverless is that now I only will focus in the operations, and I will handle each operation by separate of the rest of the other ones. So serverless is based in functions. I will develop a function that is the minimal logical unit of my system. And, uh, this will be scalable. We will run that in ephemeral containers. This of ephemeral containers means that we will something elas with elasticity. And this is because in a serverless environment, I will have one function for a 10 each request. So that means that in one moment I am receiving 100 requests, I will have 100 functions running in that moment for a 10 these ones. So is one function running for each request. Uh, the next thing is that is focus on just development. Many, many uh, serverless solutions provide to us the option that we program in that directly in the cloud, just the code, and I don't need to configure any uh, development environment or for main tests or something like that. It's just programming and things is running. 
Uh, we will not have time, but I have a, an example of a function. When I create a function for say, read the information to the cloud and add information to a database, uh, and it's like seven minutes, including the video that when I am creating the database. But what happens in serverless is that sometimes uh, the complexity to handle this is increasing. Because in a monolith, everything is there. The problem is when I am making my uh, deployments to productions or testing all these things. When I am uh, dividing in microservices, the problem is that I am need to handle right now every microservices independently. In functions, I have just one function. So sometimes came problems like how I will uh, handling, for example, the versioning of my functions because I am not versioning a whole of things. I am versioning each one uh, by separated. Other thing that happens sometimes in big system is that uh, I have some things that I use in all my things. For example, I save uh, in database uh, some logs when I connect to other services, what I send to that service and what they send to me. Uh, this is because sometimes I have problems with, uh, with the clients that say it's your fault because you are sending to me the wrong things. And I say, no, here is, uh, is your fault. Uh, well, uh, what are the principles of server is that we will not manage the servers. Some people is scary about that, but I think if I just will need one service for that, it's not needed. We have high availability because for each request, I will have one, uh, one function running. And then it's flexible scaling. And the final thing is that pay as you go. In a serverless environment in the cloud, I only pay when my, server, my, my functions are running. And what happened is that most of the clouds have a solution like for 1,000 requests of your function will be free. And an IoT project, as usually, don't raise this 1,000 requests. So that means that I will not pay for have a backend for my IoT solution, right? That is something really, really good. So I will go in. Uh, here are some uh, pictures. So here we have a web app, but can be a... Uh, a client, uh, we will put in front an API gateway that is the one that we handle all the endpoints. What things that happen with the functions, like every function is something independently to the other ones. Each cloud assign an uh, independent endpoint that something is really big, uh, another difference for anyone. So we use the API gateway for can use a specific uh, domain with some, uh, I call this the last name for the end name, and they will redirect all the things to, to our functions. In the microservices, the API gateway, for example, right now in uh, new approaches, is the one that is handling the authorization and uh, the authorization process. So if we don't pass the authorization in an API gateway, uh, our function never run. So this is our the function. Uh, this is a few more complex uh, solution for the API Gateway. In that, here is a show where the, the API Gateway communicate with the authentication service. Uh, then we go to the functions. Uh, the functions don't need to precisely stay connected to the database. Can be a storage or a message pipeline. Uh, other thing uh, really interesting about serverless that is not related with uh, the IoT uh, ecosystem is that sometimes are even triggered. So we can connect to for detect changes in a storage or in a database. So I really use it for process images, for example. So when an image arrives to a storage, they take the image, reduce the volume, and all those things. And finally, because we have so just less than a minute, but we can use cloud solutions. So I don't need to create everything from zero for make IoT solutions. I can go to the cloud, and the cloud have, uh, in that some clouds have a specific solutions for a specific so, uh, world solutions of IoT projects. So we have uh, Oracle IoT solutions, for example, all of them we will have an IoT, and you can use their specific uh, products for make big data for IoT or run uh, artificial intelligence for IoT or create some uh, applications for IoT. We have here is the Microsoft IoT solution, we have the Google solution, uh, we have this is uh, IBM Watson for IoT solutions. So IBM Watson is a, a lot of related with artificial intelligence. Uh, this is from Amazon. Uh, this is interesting because this is our solution for Cisco. Cisco has a lot of hardware that we can use uh, for create IoT solutions. So for example, here you can find an API gateway that will be a, a specific hardware for save all your information. And we have other clouds, not only the famous one, uh, creating solutions. Uh, here 
here we have a Salesforce. Uh, this is other one, CAM, and uh, ThingsWorks in Cloud, Predix Edge. So all this is what we do in this section, right? Analyze our data, take action, or create applications for our IoT solutions. So for finish this, uh, this is the link to the GitHub when all these slides are, if you want to go and read that, and we don't have more time. So thank you for coming. <laughs>